Nothing in this video should be interpreted as legal advice. I can't tell you how to make decisions for yourself, but I will share how I took on tyrants in Buena Vista, Virginia. I hope others can learn and improve from my methods as I had much success but know there is much more progress to be made to tame the ever encroaching authoritarian government. I will cover my philosophy when dealing with government agents. Then I will go over my experience acting pro se in district court without a lawyer. Finally, I will explain my process for taking civil action against tyrants. Some may feel exercising your rights is kind of like using magic words to keep the police at bay. Phrases like, am I being detained or am I free to go? Or, I don't answer questions. It also kind of feels like a battle of the wits sometimes. They will do their best to put me in a cage and I will do my best to prevent them. I feel it's more of a philosophy and a style. Each activist develops on their own based on their own beliefs. That's what government is really. The belief that a certain group of people have authority over the rest of us and we somehow have a moral obligation to obey. These people make rules for us and write themselves exempt. They do an excellent job at keeping the facade that the law is fair and impartial and nobody is above it, but we all know that's not true. For example, Hillary Clinton, Jeffrey Epstein, or Mitchell Harrison. Coming from Lynchburg? Uh, do I have to answer this question? No, you don't have to. Alright, sit tight. 21, can I get you this way? I know that no matter what question it is, even something seemingly innocent as asking where I'm going and where I'm coming from, is that officer trying to implicate me to a certain location, potentially incriminating me to a crime that I did not even commit? The slightest of cooperation with their tyrannical advances can land me in jail for months or years over answering seemingly innocent questions. Many times people get in trouble, it's because they tell on themselves. I'm not doing myself any favors talking to police, period. Doesn't mean I'm hiding something. It only means I want nothing to do with armed agents of the state trying to enforce any number of codes or statutes on me. I don't consent. Just, I'm just letting you know I don't consent to it. I know you're gonna do what you're gonna do anyway. I'm just kind of making it clear that I don't consent. Any and all interactions with government officials are without my consent. By making it clear during the interaction, it will help me later in court if there's any confusion as to whether my interaction was a consensual one. Police will manufacture consent by using deceptive interrogation techniques in order to make you feel comfortable with giving up your rights. They're trained to lie and the Supreme Court has ruled they can lie, but you cannot lie to them. Why would I allow a stranger to go through my personal effects, a stranger who is attempting to incarcerate me and has the potential of planting drugs on me? Police are human and completely capable of planting drugs, even if highly unlikely. I'm not willing to gamble with my freedom that this officer isn't one of those who would plant drugs. I also know that even if they don't find drugs, but think they do, they will use notoriously inaccurate field drug tests which have landed people in jail for vitamins or bird poop. So this is for officer safety reasons is why. Well, if you're fearing for your safety, shouldn't I be allowed to just go along my way? My position hasn't changed now that I'm detained. I'm in no way here of my own volition and would like to be on my way as soon as the current threat of violence is mitigated. This is of course until the next unwanted interaction I have with government. I feel it's always a good idea to make it clear my intentions are to be on my way and out of this non-consensual situation. Okay. Well under duress, I'll go ahead and get out. Although I don't consent to anything the government does, I will comply under duress. Government has a monopoly of violence and has given itself the alleged authority to violate us through the manipulation of Supreme Court decisions and a total disregard for the Constitution. They impose their will on us like that of a rapist or robber and we must comply. 
When I go to the DMV to renew my license, it's not because I consent or believe it has anything to do with my ability to drive. I pay taxes every year, not because I consent or want any of the government's alleged services they force upon us. It's because I know men with guns will cage me or even murder me if I don't comply. The same goes for a simple traffic stop as well. I know if I physically resist the enforcement of unjust laws as I'm morally righteous in doing, I will ultimately be murdered by government thugs. Legality does not equal morality, as it was one time legal to own slaves and genocide entire races of people. So just because police are legally allowed to do something doesn't mean it's right. The Supreme Court has constantly failed we the people, choosing to no longer recognize many of our inalienable rights. If you're in the trunk, just tell me you're going to use violence against me and I'll go ahead and open the trunk. That's, yes, that's essentially what's happening. You, I either open the trunk or you're going to either destroy my property or you're going to use violence against me in order to get me to open the trunk. So I like to make it clear I'm under duress to expose the force and violence used by government to inflict their will on nonviolent, peaceful people like me who just want to be left alone and no longer extorted. You refuse to open it. Sir, if you want me to unlock the trunk, I will. I'm duress. Just for their privacy, since I did hear him request that, if you do post this anywhere, you have to blur out their images and their car. They have a right to privacy, okay? They're okay. citizens, so just make sure you, you don't violate their privacy. This is, this is a public place. I understand that. I'm not they going have to. Right to privacy. You can say that all you want. Yes, I can. That's fine. If a situation is brought before a court, I want it to be absolutely clear I was given a direct lawful order. In order for a command to be lawful, it must be backed by a penal code, statute, or case law. Although I don't recognize the validity of most of these legal fictions, I know I must be aware that they do and are willing to kill me to enforce them. So this is for officer safety reasons as well. The reason I exited the vehicle on request was due to the mention of officer safety. I knew the Supreme Court had ruled in Pennsylvania v. Mims that citizens must exit the vehicle if demanded for officer safety. Officer safety is a blanket term tyrants use to justify all sorts of infringement. So unfortunately, I had to comply with this request or he would have believed he was justified in a violent extraction from my vehicle. You want to unlock it? I don't want to. Are you, are you forcing me? Police often give unlawful orders, so I do my best to differentiate. Since there are tens of thousands of potentially applicable laws sometimes, I don't know if something is a lawful order or not, so I will simply not act. If they are certain it is a lawful order, then I will not resist their advances, but I will not facilitate them either. I will speak only to dispute any manufactured reason they come up with to violate me and my rights. Hey, you gonna open up your trunk? You gonna open up your trunk? If Hogan had actually demanded I give him my keys or unlock the door, I would have made him retrieve the keys from my pocket, but not resisted or prevented him. I would have just made it clear he was acting against my will while he was doing it and continued documenting it. If they want to violate my rights, I will make them work for it and shine a light on it every step of the way. In part one, I showed the world where these officers are nothing more than manipulative, glorified burglars, liars, and kidnappers. You can find police like this in nearly, if not all, municipalities across the country. I lock and secure my belongings as a good habit to have for protection against all kinds of burglars and thieves, not just the government sanctioned ones. A free American citizen has no duty to open his doors to an investigation to potentially incriminate him. This right was even recognized in Hale v. Henkel. He owes no duty to the state or to his neighbors to divulge his business or to open his doors to an investigation so far as it may tend to incriminate him. He owes no duty to the state since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. 
This means the original purpose of government was to protect property rights. I will do my best to impede any attempts to enforce frivolous codes and infractions on me to collect revenue for an overbloated government who no longer prioritizes property rights, but instead attempts to violate them at every turn. Well, if you think it'll fly, I'm good with that. We got probable cause to search it. He's interfering with our duties. Not opening my doors or lock containers is not criminal activity. And if they believe their courts will back them in the violation of these spaces, then by all means, they can try. And I will not resist, but certainly will not assist them, only document. They are, after all, the men with guns who are more than willing to initiate force on peaceful people. Isn't the trunk considered a secured container requiring a warrant? Some would dispute whether the police need probable cause or a warrant for locked containers, but either way, my position is I will not facilitate the violation of my privacy or my rights. When I'm forced into a non-consensual situation with an ego-driven cop, I feel it's best to stay cool while still asserting myself. I know police will eventually show their true colors and I will do my best to capture it and show others. For example, here, Corporal Hogan clearly and unabashedly exemplifies the rapist mentality of many police officers. I'm not asking for consent. Many people like the prosecutor, judge, jury, or general public will later try to pick apart anything I do wrong when I'm forced into a police interaction. Public perception goes a long way and a rational judge will not want to look unfair to the public when the video evidence is so blatant even the biggest of bootlickers will have to concede. The camera doesn't lie, and it's the best weapon against tyranny we have. The First Amendment recognizes my right to record in public places to document reality with an unbiased perspective. So this is my philosophy for handling government officials. I don't answer questions as a general rule. Any question they have is meant to incriminate me. I don't consent to searches, or anything for that matter. I like to make it clear that my intentions are to be on my way. Anytime I'm forced into compliance, I make it clear it's only under duress and never assist them in violating me or my rights. I only follow direct orders backed by a statute, code, or case law. If I'm unsure it's a lawful order, I just won't act at all. I lock and secure all my containers I am willing to have my property damaged to make a point that the real criminals are those wearing a badge and costume violating my privacy and the Fourth Amendment. I stay calm and imagine a prospective jury or judge is watching and document every interaction with government sanctioned criminals, uh, I mean police. I contacted Mark Stevens, author of the books Adventures in Legal Land and Government Indicted. He sold me templates for a discovery request and other motions. I was coached on how to navigate the legal system and mitigate governmental attacks from a volunteer's perspective using the Socratic method. I will link to his channel in the description. I took the template for the discovery slash Brady request and filled it out to fit me and my case. I sent the Commonwealth Attorney a copy into the district court where I was summoned. In the request, I asked for body cam footage, officer statements, any and all exculpatory evidence. I also informed them I was complying under threat, duress, and coercion only to avoid further aggression against me and was not a waiver of jurisdiction. Obviously, this is the way I prefer to do things and others may wish to submit to the court's jurisdiction. After receiving no response for a few weeks, I contacted the Commonwealth Attorney's Office via telephone and reached Christopher Russell. He glanced over the motion and told me to come in and he would provide me with the body cam video and other requested documents on a certain date. I came in and was given all the documentation and video requested except for evidence of jurisdiction without protest. I even received the bonus video of Hogan inside the police department while I was locked in the cage. I hope he continues to act fairly and comply with the law as the new district court judge in Buena Vista. Once I finally had the body cam, I created a transcript of the video word for word with time markers. This was very useful as a reference in court, as well as later in my civil suit. 
I researched the statute and case law pertaining to the obstruction of justice charge. I found all elements of the crime. Elements are essential facts that all must be proven to convict a defendant. Without all the elements, the case falls apart and doesn't have a leg to stand on. There is Virginia case law that states there must be, quote, direct action and forcible or threatened means, as stated in Jones v. Commonwealth. To constitute obstruction of an officer in the performance of his duty, there must be acts clearly indicating an intention on the part of the accused to prevent the officer from performing his duty, as to obstruct ordinarily implies opposition or resistance by direct action and forcible or threatened means. It means to obstruct the officer himself, not merely oppose or impede the process for which the officer is armed. I watched the video evidence and compared it to the sworn statement I received in the discovery request. I reduced the questions down to the real hard hitters, as I knew the sovereign judge had a short tolerance for my questions at the pretrial advisement and basically forced me out of the courtroom, having one of his deputies walk up behind me and escort me out. As you may have seen in the previous video, Hogan claimed I refused and that he asked twice to unlock the vehicle. Both of these statements are absolutely false. You don't unlock it? It's not a lawful command. And I don't want to. Are you, are you forcing me? It's not a refusal. When I went to court, I armed myself with the body cam footage in the original unedited format given to me from the Commonwealth's attorney, my transcript, Hogan's statement, and my list of questions I prepared for him. Some of the questions for Hogan included, at what point exactly did I lock my doors? How did the dog indicate to you an alert on my vehicle? What reasonable suspicion did you have to extend the traffic stop to run your dog around my vehicle? Would you consider you going to unlock it to be a lawful command? When I arrived at court, I realized Mr. Russell was a no-show and left Hogan to engage in this malicious prosecution on his own. This was smart on his part as I can only assume he watched the video and chose not to participate. After Hogan gave his false testimony, I gave him enough rope to hang himself with my various leading questions. Then I entered the body cam video into evidence. This is where the transcript came in handy. I referred the bailiff, Jeremiah, seen here, to the appropriate time on Hogan's body cam video that proved he in fact did not give me a lawful order, nor did I refuse. The judge immediately dismissed the case. I showed my receipt for a new inspection and this was dismissed as well. Still had to pay court fines for the inspection but not the obstruction charge. My only regret is I did not hire a court transcriptionist that day as the district court is a court of no record. Nonetheless, I was happy to have these frivolous charges dismissed and I would now go on the attack. Just to recap, I filed a discovery slash Brady request then followed up with Commonwealth or District Attorney. I studied statute and case law and compared it to the sworn statement and video. I found the elements of the crime I was accused of. I created video transcript with time markers. I compared sworn statements with body cam video. I formulated questions for my accuser. I held his feet to the fire and didn't let off. I took the evidence I gathered and compiled a document articulating the facts of my case and my position to the best of my ability. It wasn't perfect, but I had a lot of detail and made my case point by point. This makes my attorney's job much easier and they use this document as a reference for the actual legal complaint I will go over shortly. I searched the web for attorneys that would take police misconduct cases and kept hitting dead ends. Many attorneys aren't brave enough to tackle these cases for various reasons. Attorneys that pursue false arrest claims told me they only took cases that involved private citizens like security guards, but stayed away from police cases as they have a lot of ways out of being held accountable. One of the main ways is qualified immunity. 
I knew from my research that these officers likely lost their qualified immunity when they stepped out of their official capacity, acting under color of law, to arrest me in retaliation for the exercise of my rights. As stated in Harlow v. Fitzgerald, qualified immunity does not protect officials who violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights of which reasonable person would have known. Then I searched in Richmond specifically because it's the capital city and I figured if anyone did it, they would probably be there or Northern Virginia. I found the Halpern Law Firm by looking for lawyers who pursue USC 42 section 1983 cases. I contacted them through their website and gave them Google Drive links and all the evidence I'd acquired, cell phone video, body cam video, officer statements, my transcript I made for the video, and my statement I had created articulating my case. I did this to make sure all the information was as digestible as possible and would have a better chance of them wanting to take my case. Once they watched the video accompanied by the transcript, they decided that this was something worth pursuing and asked me to come in for a consultation. I came in and we discussed the facts of the case in further detail. 1983 claims are what's known as a tort. For tort claims, you have up to two years to inform the parties of your intent to sue. This was no issue for me as I was quick to move after my criminal case as I wasn't going to let this fly. I told them of all the people I'd spoken with who said that they believe the Buena Vista Police Department are corrupt. I also brought up the Vista Links Golf Course, which is funded by a loan that the city defaulted on. The collateral for the loan included the City Hall building as well as the Police Department building. They were taken to court by their loan company where a federal judge decided that the debt was a moral obligation, but not a legal one. A new lawsuit is filed in federal court against the city of Buena Vista and its Vista Links golf course debt. ACA Financial, the firm that insured bonds to finance the golf course, filed the lawsuit in U.S. District Court in Lynchburg on Friday. It addresses many of the legal claims made in state court against the city. The lawsuit asks the court to give ACA the right to seize City Hall and other properties which were pledged as collateral when the bonds were issued in 2005. It also asks the court to appoint a receiver who would control the city-owned properties to ensure that they're maintained. Now, as we reported, ACA has been making payments of $660,000 a year for the past few years because the city said it couldn't pay the golf course debt. A decade-long financial dispute over a local golf course is finally over. 10 News can confirm a federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit against the city of Buena Vista. 10 News reporter Tommy Lopez has reaction from the city attorney and the community. This is the lengthy 37-page decision a federal judge handed down Thursday afternoon. It dismisses the lawsuit over the Vista Lynx golf course. Brian Kearney, the city attorney, says they've been hoping for this ruling for a year. Of course it's relief because you never know. Uh, we always anticipated this, but you never know. That's whenever you go to court, so we were very happy to see the judge's ruling. The dispute is over payments. ACA Financial has been covering the city's debt since 2014, threatening to seize control of City Hall. But the judge sided with the city, saying the debt is a, quote, moral obligation, and the city only has to pay it if it chooses to. They determined that they could not do that without affecting the core services that the city was going to provide its citizens. Kearney says the golf course is staying open, but it has never made money. Even with the lawsuit behind the city, Kearney says that it's still not in a great position financially. The city is struggling as any small cities are. They have limited um, economic base. I mean, there's lots of good things happening in the city, but uh, we're not flush and rolling in money. Business owners we talked to are happy to hear about the ruling. Uh, but we are ecstatic over that. I'm so glad that burden has now been put to rest. Yeah. That making me feel good. And I hope, you know, get everything better a little bit at a time. ACA sent us a response less than two hours ago saying, quote, we intend to appeal the decision. In the meantime, we will continue to press the city to meet its promise to pay on these bonds. This is the first lawsuit of its kind ever filed in Virginia, one that deals with a locality not paying for this reason, according to the city attorney. In Buena Vista, Tommy. My attorney and his team informed me about what was called a Monell claim. Monell claims are brought under USC 42 section 1983 to include the municipality of the city due to systematic issues 
created by written or unwritten policy. This means that not only can I list these two officers in my complaint, but also the municipality, City of Buena Vista. This could substantially increase my earnings and blow this whole thing wide open. We concluded our meeting and agreed. I would find people willing to speak with them and they would implore investigators to interview them and gather relevant information to build our Monell claim. They sent a letter to Buena Vista informing them of our intent to sue and to preserve all evidence. I took to social media and created a Facebook page called Reform the Buena Vista Police Department. I created a post asking if anyone had been victim to unfair policing practices in the city and was flooded with responses. Of all the people that responded, only a small fraction were willing to speak with our investigators. Once we acquired enough cases for our Monell claim, we drafted our complaint. I will link to a copy in the description, but here I will skim over some of the key issues listed in the complaint. The legal complaint starts off with the listing of jurisdiction and venue appropriate for these claims. In this case, it would have been assigned to the Lynchburg Division of the Western District of Virginia. This is a federal court. Then it goes on to list the parties involved. The parties include me as the plaintiff, good citizen, and the two officers involved as well as the city of Buena Vista, as mentioned previously in reference to the Monell claim. We continue on to list the factual allegations. Defendants Corporal Hogan and Lieutenant Harrison searched Good Citizen's vehicle without probable cause. Good Citizen was seized without probable cause and Corporal Hogan subsequently undertook a malicious prosecution of Good Citizen. Buena Vista Police Department has a policy and custom of harassing civilians without probable cause. Here, we list out the situations brought to us by those who contacted me on the Reform the BVPD Facebook page I created and claim to be treated unfairly by them as well. Two of these specifically mention Lieutenant Harrison as a canine handler. After the Monell claim description, the complaint continues on to list the seven counts against the collective defendants. Count 1. Section 1983, false arrest in violation of the 4th and 14th Amendment, Corporal Hogan and Lieutenant Harrison. Count 2, Section 1983, retaliatory arrest in violation of the 1st Amendment, Corporal Hogan. Count 3, Section 1983, unreasonable search in violation of the 4th and 14th Amendments, Corporal Hogan and Lieutenant Harrison. Count 4, Unreasonable search in violation of Virginia Code 19.2-59, Corporal Hogan and Lieutenant Harrison. Count 5, Section 1983, Conspiracy to Deprive Constitutional Rights, Corporal Hogan and Lieutenant Harrison. Count 6, Section 1983, Municipal Liability, City of Buena Vista. Count 7, Virginia Common Law Malicious Prosecution, Corporal Hogan. Then finally, all of this was followed up by the damages section. Although we may have asked for a very high sum of money in the complaint, unfortunately the final result of settlement was not quite near the 1.1 million originally requested. We contacted the city attorney and they in turn were in contact with the insurance company who deals with the complaints. We agreed to sit down for a mediation. My attorney and I sat down with the city attorney and the representative of the insurance company, as well as a retired judge who was acting as mediator in the matter. After a brief introduction, the opposing counsel sat in a separate room and the mediator rotated between rooms. We started at a very high monetary amount and Buena Vista's counsel started with a very low amount. The price of potential settlement moved in increments until ultimately reached an agreed upon undisclosed amount somewhere in the middle. That about sums it up and would be glad to take questions in the comments section regarding the process. You can also check out links in the description for the video Audit the Audit did on my case and my appearance on Libertarian Crusaders podcast where we go into details that may not have been covered here. So this is how I took civil action against tyrants. I created a document articulating my case to solicit an attorney that would be willing to help me. 
Attorneys that take these type cases are only willing to pursue a small fraction of them. That's why it's important to create this document. It can help them determine if your case is worth pursuing for them. I determined if the officers involved could hide behind qualified immunity. I looked in the capital city and other large cities in my state as not every city has attorneys willing to pursue these matters in federal court. I discovered I had what was called a Monell claim as well considering these officers were likely influenced by their municipality to collect revenue for their failing city. Then we drafted our complaint and sent it over to the city attorney. He determined that this was something we should settle pre-trial to avoid the embarrassment for the city in front of a federal judge. We scheduled a mediation and ultimately reached an undisclosed settlement. One more for freedom, baby! Woo! <laughs> Exercise your rights, you will lose them.